Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on materials. The background material for which is in chapter 4. We are continuing to be in section 1 of chapter 4, Basic Materials Properties. In this video we're going to do a materials example where we distribute loads from materials of high stress capacity to materials of low stress capacity. So this is kind of the statement of the problem. To carve out arch architectural space, we redirect and concentrate stress lines, focusing them in materials of higher stress capacity. We already talked about this in the case of wood structures, where we had a series of joists that carry well, first of all, decking that carry floor loads and roof loads to joists and then joists that burden uh, compressive walls. And then with multiple floors, there's even more compression. And then we'll remove some of the wall material because where these highly stressed elements reach the ground, the stresses must be redistributed again. Since soil is typically the weakest material in our structural system. So we're going to assume that a column at the bottom of a structure has imposed upon its top the following axial forces P dead of 15 kips, P live of 45 kips. The factored total load would be. P factored imposed is equal to 1.2 times P dead plus 1.6 times P live. Since P dead is 15 kips, the 1.2 gets multiplied by 15 kips. P live is 45, so the 1.6 gets multiplied times 45 kips, and we end up with 90 kips total. We're going to determine the design stress for the steel in the column, which is based on both the resistance factor and the yield stress of the steel in the column. In other words, it's phi, which is the resistance factor, times F yield for the steel. Now, we haven't really talked about this very much, but I'm going to introduce this piece of information in this particular example and you will use it for the assignment that you're going to work which will be similar in nature. <clears throat> for a steel column, V steel is 0 0.85. Now, what that's saying is we're going to downsize our expectations of what the column can do or in other words, we're going to increase the size of the column and make it stronger because we don't have absolute confidence in the column. And by the way, this is probably more information than you need, but when I worked out this example for the steel manual that applied at that time and which is used throughout the book, uh, fee for a steel column was 0 0.85. That number has since been increased to 0 0.90 which, by the way, is also the fee factor for a steel beam. So they originally felt like columns were not as predictable and as reliable as steel beams, but they have since changed their thinking on that, and now they both have the same resistance factor. <clears throat> now, we're going to size this column based on this design stress. Phi steel times Fy steel. <coughs> we're for the moment ignoring buckling, which we're going to get to at the future in the future. But for the moment, we can say using this sizing procedure sets an absolute lower limit to the column size. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we can inhibit to a large degree the effects of buckling if we're willing to take the column cross section and turn it into a tube so that it becomes much more resistive to buckling. 
So for the purposes of this particular problem, we're going to assume a, a 65 KSI steel column. In your assignment, uh, the grade of steel might be different, but for this particular one, we're taking 65 KSI steel, which means its yield stress is, occurs at 65 KSI. And the design stress is then going to be the resistance factor times Fy, or in other words, 0.85 times 65 kips per square inch, which comes out to 55.25 kips per square inch, is the design stress under the full factored load. That's the allowed, the maximum allowed stress under full factored load. In step two, we're going to determine the column cross-sectional area required to support the factored load being delivered to the top of the column based on the limit set by phi for the steel times Fy for the steel. In other words, the area of the column is going to equal the full factor imposed load divided by this design stress, which is phi times F yield. So in the previous slide, we worked that out to be 55.25 kips per square inch. And a few slides back, we figured out that the full factored load was 90 kips. Now we got an inch squared down to the denominator, which is a kind of a messy thing to have floating around. So we want to clean that up. <clears throat> and the way we're going to do it is we're going to multiply this overall denominator by an inch squared. <coughs> and then we're going to multiply this numerator by an inch squared so that everything inside of this square bracket uh, is basically another way of writing one. So this inch squared cancels that inch squared, and we now have an inch squared in the numerator. And you're going to find that I go through this uh, rather laboriously, uh, partly because the number one thing that students screw up over and over and over again is units. And I don't know how many times I have to say it, but I'll say it as often as I can. You've got to be systematic and thorough in your units. Now, some of you who are really facile in this sort of thing, you've got little rules like I can flip that inch squared up there and you know it already from having done this kind of thing repetitively for quite a while. But keep in mind that is not a mathematical rule. It's something that you have sort of learned over time that you can get away with doing. Okay, so when we divide 90 by 55.25, we get 1.629. The two kips cancel each other out. We were left with an inch square up here after this inch squared canceled that one. So we're in units of square inches, which is what we want to be because we're looking for the area of the column. So 1.629 square inches, which is a really small amount of material. And think about this 90 kips. That's roughly 45 Honda Civics piled on top of each other, on top of a column, the cross-section of which is only 1.6, roughly, square inches. Okay, so we're going to determine the column self-weight, and then what is the factored self-weight of the column. So the self-weight of the column is going to be the density of the steel times the volume of the steel. And that's going to be the density times the length of the column times the area of the column, which at the moment is this minimum area that we calculated. And uh, we didn't say this up front, but for this particular problem, the length of the column is 10 feet. We just calculated that the minimum cross-sectional area that we could have is 1.629. And then we have here the density of the steel, which is 490 pounds per cubic foot. So when we multiply all these numbers together, we've got to clean up our unit somehow. This is in per cubic foot. Here we have a foot, which is nice because it cancels one of those, but then we got inches squared. So to clean this up, we're going to convert these inches squared to feet by multiplying by a foot per 12 inches, and we put that inside the square bracket to indicate that it's a, another way of writing one, which we're using to uh, 
clean up our units. And we have to do that twice to get rid of these inches squared. And when we get done, we have units of pounds and it's 55.4, or in other words, 0 0.554 kips. Now, as we go through this design, every time we calculate a dead load, we're obligated to apply a dead load factor uh, before we can continue on down through the structure and the sizing of the various parts of the structure. So we're going to say the factored weight of the column is 1.2 times that number there, where this is the, the load factor for dead loads, and we get 0 0.0665 kips. So now we're going to account for the factored self-weight of the column itself to determine the total factored force in the column at the base of the column. So we have 90 kips at the top. We've got this, which was imposed. That's the total factored imposed load on the top of the column. This is the weight of the column. So at the bottom of the column, we've got 90.067 kips. And it should immediately leap off the page to you that the weight, the self-weight of this column is a negligible part of what it's supporting. It only weighs that much and it's supporting that much. Or in other words, another way of putting it is, uh, it weighs 66 pounds and it's supporting 90,000 pounds. All right, so in step five of this process, we're gonna determine the crawl column cross-sectional area required to keep the stress at the bottom of the column within the d design stress limit. In other words, we now want to get down to the column, we've got this new force we're sizing for, which is the 90 imposed plus the self-weight of the column. And we've seen this, we did this formula before, where we, we d divide by um, the design stress, which is the yield stress divided by 0.85 or reduced by a factor of 0.85. So we put that number here, we divide it into that, and we get 1.630 inches squared. Now in this assignment, we're going to repeat the steps three, four, and five until, as I mentioned here, you are totally bored. In other words, when we did this, we've got a little bit bigger column than we had before. Before we had a column of 1.629 inches. Now we have a column of 1.63 inches squared. And by the way, no one in their right minds would bother doing the next iteration, but we're gonna do it here to prove the point. And when we go through, we're going to discover that the total factor load delivered to the base plate from the column is rounded up 90.07. All right, so, and by the way, you really wouldn't do very many iterations to arrive at that number before it becomes really obvious that the self-weight of the column is a negligible issue in this design or this sizing operation. All right, so we need to then put that load into the base plate. And the sizing of the base plate is going to be governed by the design stress for the concrete and the spread footing. So we have to find, and by the way, this is a really crucial point that many students get confused on. We are sizing the base plate, not for the sake of the base plate, but for the sake of protecting the concrete. In other words, the concrete has a much lower stress capacity than the steel in the column. And the column will do serious damage to the concrete if we don't distribute that load. So that's why we have a base plate on it. Uh, that means that we're going to determine the area of the base plate, which is the steel plate based on the stress capacity of the concrete. So we have to find the design stress for the concrete. And that again is based on the compression crushing stress of the concrete and the resistance factor 
for the concrete. So that's this is phi sub c is the resistance factor, f sub c is the compression stress rating for the concrete at which point the concrete shatters. And it turns out concrete is a much less reliable material than is steel, so the phi factor is only 0 0.65 and the uh, crushing stress for the concrete was 5 kips per square inch. So when you multiply those together, our design stress for the concrete is 3.25 kips. So we're going to start off ignoring the self weight of the base plate and ask the question what should the area of the steel base plate be to avoid exceeding the design stress in the concrete of the spread footing. So we say sizing the base plate to avoid overstressing of the concrete. We say the area of the plate is the factored imposed load plus the factored uh, self weight of the column divided by the design stress for the concrete. So it's 90.07 kips divided by 3.25 kips per square inch. And again, we're going to get rid of the kips down here by multiplying inches squared times this overall denominator. And to keep the mathematics clean and correct, we have to put an inches squared in the numerator also. This inches squared cancels that and leaves that inches squared. Kips cancel each other, so we end up with 27.71 square inches. Now, um, we're going to try and account for the self weight of the steel base plate to see how important it is. Um, and right now I'm going to tell you that the steel base plate is assumed to be 1.5 inches. And the reason I'm just giving you that number, I mean, normally that would be a part of designing the base plate. I'm giving you that number because you don't understand all the bending stress issues and the complex mathematics that's necessary to figure out the thickness of that plate. And in fact, uh, we have certain guidelines that engineers typically use for how thick that base plate needs to be relative to the size of it. So we often don't go through the detailed calculations anyway, but for sure we're not getting into that at this early stage in your education. So we're going to say the weight of the steel base, base plate is the density times the volume, which is the density times the thickness times the area. The density of the steel is 490 pounds per cubic foot. The thickness is 1.5 inches, and the area that we just calculated in the previous slide was 27.71 square inches. And now we got a bunch of inches here that we need to clean up with these foot per, per 12 inch um, cleanup factors. And so we're basically converting all of these inches to feet so that these feet cubed will cancel that feet cubed. And we get 11.8 pounds. Uh, which is 0 0.0118 kips. Now, just to give you a sense of scale, um, this is a square a little more than five inches on a side, and it's one and a half inches thick. Uh, and we get that, by the way, by taking this number and taking the square root, so it's five point something or other. It's certainly not six, which would be 36 square inches. Uh, 5 squared would be 25 square inches. So we know we're a little over 5 inches um, on a side and 1 and a half inches thick. And we would think about that as being roughly on the order of a 10 pound barbell weight. Turns out in this case when we run the numbers it's 11.8. We're going to apply our factored weight um, for the steel base place. In other words, our dead load factor is 1.2 we multiply it in and we get this number for the um, factored self weight of the steel base plate. So the net force on the concrete is now going to be the 90.67 kips that we calculated before, um, which I think I rounded up to 7, but we'll go with this for the moment. Um, and then we add this 0 0.141 kips for the self factor self weight of the base plate and we end up with this number here, which is still a really small change. 
Um, and what we conclude is that the self weight of the base plate is negligible. But we're going to have to prove that. So we're going to go through this process again where we put in this new number and divide by the design stress in the concrete and we get 27.27 and we would repeat these steps but let me just point out that 27.72 is only in the fourth place larger than what we calculated before. So given that we never know anything in the business we're in to more than three place accuracy, we would conclude that when we started at 27.71 and then accounted for the self weight of the base place plate, we only got 27.72 we will conclude that in fact uh, to the kind of accuracy that we're capable of in structures uh, we don't need to cycle through that number anymore we have converged on 27.72 so I wrote here repeat steps 10 through 12 until you're totally bored but in fact we don't have to repeat them at all because no iterations are required since the answer in the last step was the same as the previous answer to three significant figures. All right, so we're going to say assuming for the moment that the self weight of the concrete spread footing is negligible, what should the area of the concrete spread footing be to avoid exceeding the design compression stress for the soil? So we're going to take the factored imposed load on the top of the column, the factored self weight of the column, the factored self weight of the base plate, and designed by the, uh, the um, stress in the soil. And in this case, um, we didn't say this beforehand, but in any problem I give you, you would get this number, which in this case was 2.3 kips per square foot. So we divide that into all these loads here, and we clean up our units. And by the way, remember this is feet squared now because we're working with a really low grade material and we come up with 39.17 square feet. So then we calculate the self weight of the concrete. Um, reinforced concrete with heavy aggregates, 150 pounds a cubic foot. Then we say it's that density times the thickness times the area of the concrete. Again, um, you wouldn't know how to calculate this, but as part of the problem, it was given that the spread footing is 12 inches thick. We just calculated that its minimum required area is 39.17 square feet to protect the soil. And again, we've ignored the self weight of the concrete so far. So now we got feet cubed, feet squared. We got this one inch floating around. So we're going to do our cleanup of the units by multiplying by one where we represent that as a foot per 12 inches. So when we multiply that out, we get 5,875 pounds or 5.875 kips. And then the factored weight of the concrete pad, we'd have to throw in the 1.2 dead load factor and we get up to 7.050 kips. Now we have to find the uh, total factored force, including the concrete. So before we had 90.08, now we're adding for the concrete 7.05, we got 97.13 kips. And now we're going to calculate a new required area for the concrete footing. So the uh, the total loads are the factory and imposed load on the top of the column, the factored self weight of the column, the factored self weight of the plate, and the factored self weight of the concrete footing. And I wrote previous here, meaning from the previous sizing operation where we weren't even accounting for this load because we didn't know how to estimate it. All that's designed, divided by the design stress in the concrete. And so we have 97.13, which we got in the previous slide. That's the sum of all this, which is that, plus that, which is that. <clears throat> and now we get 42.23 square feet. And this is substantially different from our previous answer. 
So now we got to go through a series of these iterations. Um, and we keep doing it, keep calculating a new required uh, footing based on the previous weight. And we do that until it uh, converges. So in the previous one, we got 42.23. Here we're getting 42.47 when we repeat it one more time. And then we get 42.49 when we repeat it again into three place accuracy, 42.47 and 42.49 square feet are uh, the same. So we can conclude that after three of these iterations, we've found the required square foot of the concrete. Now, the concrete is what's responsible for protecting the soil and the soil itself is really weak. So that's why when we get to the concrete footing, um, we're discovering, and of course the concrete footing is really thick also. So we're discovering that uh, ignoring the self weight of the concrete is not something we can do, whereas we could have just pretty much ignored the self weight of the steel column and the steel base plate. So one of the questions we want to ask is how much larger an area is the concrete spread footing than the cross-sectional area of the steel column? So we come and we take a ratio of the area of the concrete pad to the area of the steel and we clean up some units here because the area of the concrete pad is in square feet and the area of the cross-section of the steel column is in inches squared and we get 3,756, which is a huge ratio. I mean, we're going from the spindly little column to a really large footing. And that's because the stress capacity of the steel is drastically higher than the stress capacity of the soil, which is why we have to have the interface elements of the steel plate and the concrete pad. If they weren't there, this steel column would just drive itself right down into the ground because the ground just couldn't resist it. And this is uh, to scale that steel column, the steel base plate, and the concrete pad. And by the way, uh, we get the sides of each of these by taking the square root of the areas that were involved. So we took the square foot, uh, the square root of the area of the column to get a side here, the square root of the area of the base plate to get a side there, and the square root of the concrete footing to get this side here. That ends our example on materials where we're distributing loads from materials of high stress capacity to materials of low stress capacity.